This is 3 News Daily. Hello there, Northeast Ohio. Welcome to a brand new week of 3 News Daily on this Monday, November 6th, the day before Election Day. I'm Stephanie Haney here with what matters most to you in our area. We start in North Olmsted today, where we're learning more about an officer-involved shooting on Alden Drive. In an updated press release we received this morning, North Olmsted police say a woman called 911 around 1.34 Saturday morning, saying that a man covered in blood told her someone was trying to kill him and his uncle. When police got to the home, they say they heard what sounded like a single gunshot and saw that the home was on fire. Police also say 27-year-old Thomas Knock ran out the front door and exchanged gunfire with them. An officer was shot and sent to the hospital with non-life-threatening injuries. Knock later died at the hospital. Police found 52-year-old Christopher Teresi dead inside the home. Police say it was a different man who approached the woman who called 911, and that man was attacked by Knock. His name is not being released right now. We will have more information on this incident coming up at 4 o'clock. And now we move to another police-involved shooting, this in Elyria. Police say they pulled over 27-year-old Dorian Williams, who you just saw there, who then took off dragging an officer with him for a short time. Williams then led police on a high-speed chase, eventually crashing through guardrails in front of a home on Chestnut. He then barricaded himself inside of a different home, and as police had that house surrounded, Williams drove through the garage right at the officers. Officers then fired at Williams. He was treated for non-life-threatening injuries and now faces several charges, including assault on a police officer and resisting arrest. Now in Euclid, the man who was arrested in connection to the fatal shooting of a teen was in court today. 20-year-old Jay Shan Vance was arrested by U.S. Marshals last week in East Cleveland. They believe he is connected to last month's shooting of 16-year-old Kashan Lamar. Lance faces several charges, including aggravated murder, felonious assault, and robbery. A teen has also been arrested in this case. Now tonight, a vigil will be held for Menor High School student Jack Sawyer, who died yesterday following his struggle with cancer. We've been following Jack's story as he was being treated for Ewing sarcoma. That's an aggressive and rare form of bone cancer. Throughout Jack's 18-month journey, he was such an inspiration to his community, his school, his family, and all of us here at 3 News. There will be a public celebration of Jack's life at Menor City Hall tonight at 6 o'clock. The community is encouraged to go there to show their support for the Sawyer family. Now, starting today, if you see fires burning in parts of the Cuyahoga Valley National Park, those are being set on purpose by the National Park Service to improve the natural habitats. The controlled burns will happen at three locations in the park from today through November 15th. The fires will burn invasive plants, improve soil conditions, and maintain grassland bird habitats. NPS says smoke in and around the park is possible, but they'll do their best to contain it. All right, we've got some exciting news for baseball fans. The Guardians have officially named their new manager. Steven Vogt from the Seattle Mariners now becomes the 45th manager in Guardians history. Before coaching for the Mariners, Vogt played for 10 years in the Major League, and during that time he was named American League All-Star catcher and was also a member of the 2021 World Champion Atlanta Braves team. The guards will officially introduce the 39-year-old on Friday, who was taking over for Terry Francona, who of course stepped down as Guardians manager at the end of this last season after 11 years. All right, it is Victory Monday here in Cleveland. The Browns knocked out the Cardinals 27 to nothing in yesterday's game. Now this is the first shutout for the Browns since 2007. We will hear more about that from Mike Polk Jr. on 3 News at 5. Deshaun Watson was back at starting QB, throwing two touchdowns and passing for 219 yards against Arizona, which is now in last place in the AFC West with a record of one win and eight losses. Up next, the Browns have a real challenge, taking on the AFC North's first place Baltimore Ravens on Sunday. As of now, the Browns, Steelers, and the Bengals all stand at five wins and three losses. Now, during the Browns' salute to service game yesterday, one Northeast Ohio veteran couple was surprised with $25,000. The team partnered with Cross Country Mortgage to help out the husband and wife veteran duo. They met on a deployment back in 2007. They actually thought they'd gotten free game tickets and a behind-the-scenes tour of the stadium when they got the surprise. It was beyond belief. We were not expecting it. I actually wanted to honor my husband more than I wanted to honor myself. 
he has more service than me and has accomplished so much more. So I, I am just beyond thrilled, but very surprised, very shocked. What a great surprise for that couple who live in Maslin. Shout out to the 330. They've got three kids, so hopefully they can do something fun with that 25 grand. All right, for decades now, the Henry Longfellow School stood as a neighborhood fixture on Cleveland's east side, and when it closed, the building could have potentially been demolished, but now it's getting new life breathed into it. Today's Mission Possible explores the former school's transformation into a new home for seniors. It's a balance of keeping the school elements, but making it feel like home. The Longfellow School has a deep connection to Cleveland's Collinwood neighborhood. Built over a century ago, thousands of students walked the halls up until 2010 when the building closed and classrooms fell silent. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But today, there is new life and a new purpose. The former school is now an apartment building for senior living. What we've been able to do is take the classrooms and convert them into residential units, and you've got very high ceilings. You've got amazing windows bringing in a lot of light. A campaign to save the building was headed by Cleveland Councilman Mike Polensic, with support from the Cleveland Restoration Society. In 2016, the Longfellow received historic landmark status. Over $23 million in funding followed, and construction finished earlier this year. They don't build them like this anymore. Look at this building. And the thought that it could have been torn down in another empty lot in the city. Now we have people employed. We have residents here that are moving in from the neighborhood. The Longfellow has 80 apartments, one and two bedrooms. 30 are inside the school and 50 are in a new addition at the back of the building. The design blends modern living with historical charm. There were some challenges, but I think it, it was in how do we preserve the space and, and retain the key elements. We preserved the chalkboard from the, the old classroom. We, wanted, we thought that was important to, to really highlight and showcase for this unit. The care for the senior community it's overwhelming, it's very nice here, it's amazing. Longfellow resident Sandra Williams moved from Willoughby to be closer to family. She immediately experienced the connection between building and neighborhood. Once you mention where you are, people know. They really know, Longfellow and most of them uh, that come here used to go here. Many former Longfellow students attended the grand opening to see the transformation. The developer hopes this work can translate to other vacant buildings across the city. It actually already has been serving as a roadmap. I think it should be uh, something that uh, that can be a good example for other developers and, and other historic buildings. Now the connection to the neighborhood can continue to grow. This will be the linchpin to rebuild and reimagine this neighborhood. There's no doubt, it's already started. Now, Stephen Rice said the hardest part of the project was securing the funding, but they pulled it together with loans from the city along with state grants and tax credits. And for Miss Williams, she's excited for new neighbors and the possibility of a gazebo near the walking path on the property. It sounds nice. All right, now the nation's attention will be on Ohio for tomorrow's general election with two major statewide issues on the ballot. If issue one passes, it will guarantee abortion rights in the state constitution. And if issue two passes, that will legalize recre recreational excuse me, marijuana use for adults 21 and over. Polls are open tomorrow, just a reminder, from 6.30 a.m. to 7.30 p.m. And another reminder for you, there are new ID requirements for when you go vote. You must provide a photo ID like your driver's license, passport, state ID, or military identification card. You can no longer bring a bank statement, paycheck, or government document. These changes were signed into Ohio law by Governor Mike DeWine at the beginning of the year. And 3 News will be keeping you up to date with continuing coverage on the election, plus up-to-the-minute results, both on your TVs and online at WKYC.com, on WKYC Plus, and on the WKYC YouTube page tomorrow. So stick with us for that. We've got everything you need to know for Election Day. All right, thanks for being with us for today's edition of 3 News Daily. Wherever you're watching or listening, we appreciate you. Have a great day. We'll be back tomorrow on Election Day with more of what matters to you here in Northeast Ohio.